Hey, good morning and good afternoon. Uh, welcome to this session. Today we will talk about procurement savings by numbers. Uh, this is an interesting session because here we're going to talk about something which is very, very important to the procurement users, right? I mean, we know that uh, savings is one of the key drivers for all practitioners here. And how do we measure that? How does it actually transfer into the actual savings that goes into the uh, account books, right? So that's what we'll uh, cover today. Just before we start, a little bit of the housekeeping. Uh, we will not open up for questions during the session. Uh, having said that, if you have any questions for um, any of the panelists, you can just uh, put that into the chat, and we will take all the questions at the end of the session. So quickly we start, let me introduce you to uh, today's panelists. We have uh, Kyle. Uh, Kyle has you know, more than 20 years of experience in this particular domain. Uh, he's a uh, leading practitioner, he's the director of the supply chain at uh, ProTVD right now. Uh, he has more than 10 years of experience with Accenture. He's come with a wealth of information and knowledge in the procurement space, and we are happy to have him share that with us today. Uh, and we also have with us Rob. Uh, Rob Walker is a manager uh, at Qualcomm. Uh, again, has you know, 20 years of uh, procurement experience. He has worked with a number of software, including SAP, Oracle, Jerry Edwards, and Lawson. Uh, and uh, more importantly, in his uh, current role at Qualcomm, he has implemented the Zykus uh, procurement uh, iSafe solution, which uh, kind of financial management solution from Zykus. And that will, uh, you know, be very relevant to what we're doing today. And what we're going to do is uh, uh, get to hear from Rob his experience with that particular uh, product. Uh, before I move ahead, just a quick uh, introduction of myself. I'm uh, Kanish Ghosh. I am part of the product management team here at Cycus. I also have been in the procurement for a long time, but I'm probably from the other side of the fence. I am from the technology development side. I've been there for a long time, worked with Oracle uh, before this. And kind of you know see what you guys are looking at probably from the you know the wearing the hat of that uh, technology geek. But uh, you know we'll uh, kind of share all of that as we go forward. Uh, just before we go, just a quick one slide look at what Zykus is doing. Uh, and we have a complete uh, source to pay uh, solution, and we've been leaders in the Gartner's Magic Quadrant for uh, three successive uh, servers in a row. I mean that's kind of something we're very proud of. Quickly moving on. Again, that's something that we want to quickly uh, touch upon. Uh, so, Zykus has this pulse of procurement study. Now, this is something that we uh, have been doing for like seven years in a row. So this is something where we interview um, a lo lot of respondents from the procurement space. Uh, we look at the entire gamut of uh, functions, uh, right from you know uh, actually the managers or the end users to you know VPs and directors of procurement. And get their thoughts and feedback in terms of how they see the proposed as in today and how they expect to change going forward. Uh, and this particular survey that I'm talking about is what we did in 2017. Uh, we had again about close to 725 respondents. Uh, we also looked at you know uh, companies of various sizes, ranging from you know the the space which we define as like about 500 million dollars uh, revenue revenue to the large, uh, huge uh, mammoths out there with revenues more than you know $5 billion, right? And one thing that uh, really uh, came across, and that is something that's probably coming across uh, throughout the year, uh, is the focus on cost savings, right? I mean, if you can see here, 67% uh, of the respondents uh, said cost savings is the, one of the most important things that they're looking at. Again, I think for you know all of the uh, practitioners out there, this is uh, kind of uh, known uh, fact, we all know about it. But having said that, you know, what, what is it we're doing about it? And that's probably what we will look at today. Now, in this current, uh, today's session, right, we want to talk about how human and finance, right, how do we, you know, to a consensus. Now, this is, we're kind of talking about the basic definition of savings. So, what is a lot of organizations even struggling to define uh, how we actually define savings from a company's perspective. Uh, Document sees it in one way, and finance would obviously see it in a different way, right? Uh, there are a lot of different thoughts, and if you just kind of look at the basic stuff, I mean, if whatever I saved, all my you know baseline prices savings, 
and it was baseline, right? I mean, is it just the last year spent? I mean, here a lot of people talking about how you know IT products keep going down. So why not use last year's product, uh, you know prices as the benchmark of the baseline price. Now, here is something that I cannot do. Is do I kind of look at a budget? Now, in, in probably comes from finance. Now, if I save against the budget, would that savings? How again they come into those murkier uh, territories where what happens is sometimes the budget is again being used up to additional items. If you uh, bought, let's say, 20 items of a particular uh, commodity, uh, we end up buying 30 because, you know, I'm able to get a better price. So the budget actually consumed, but we actually bought more. How I transfer that into savings, right? Those are the stuff that I think you know every company is kind of struggling to define, and this is where you know we want to find out how as you know thought leaders we can come together and come up with a consensus. Uh, now, uh, kind of moving ahead, this is what we want to do today. Uh, we want to kind of challenge the status quo that we have, where we're saying that procurement and you know finance are kind of you know separated by this uh, wall, and we're kind of throwing those numbers. At the, from across the wall, and want to kind of discover as we go along today. You know, a lot of organizations have uh, tried to resolve this. We'll uh, like to hear uh, from Kyle, and then Rob will share his experience with Qualcomm as how they're kind of bridging this gap and ensuring that you know procurement and finance are kind of sitting on the same side and having this one same you know broad, clear, and happy picture in front of them. Right. Uh, with this, what I'll do is I'll hand over uh, to Kyle to just uh, take us through his journey. Uh, Kyle, uh, over to you. Uh, director within Protivity. For those of you that don't know Protivity, Protivity is a global consulting firm that, that specializes in finance, IT, risk, and business process improvement. Specifically, as Kanishka had mentioned, um, I sit and am focused day-to-day -day in supply chain. But really within supply chain, my background, my experience, the kind of things that I deal with on a day-to-day -day basis, the kind of things that I get really exciting about, is really on sourcing and procurement and procurement transformation. And really when I use transformation, I'm helping companies develop in high-performing and strategically-minded procurement of excellences. So, so Usually that takes a lot of effort and there's kind of cost to go through that transformational process. We, we typically work with clients up front and we develop annual strategic sourcing plans with them to help drive savings that can help finance that transformational effort. And hence a big reason why we're very, very focused on how to measure and track benefits. Um, it also comes out of you know my history from sourcing and procurement that I've been on the is I've been there trying to demonstrate and demonstrate the value that procurement brings to a business, defended savings. I've talked about like how we measure and track it. So, so I think this is a very, very important topic, and and I really like the slide before this one, with procurement and finance with a brick wall between them, because in a lot of ways, a lot of organizations, that's the way that things are, are structured and organized, and there isn't a really good effective working relationship between between finance and, and procurement. And just to kind of highlight that, um, you know, one things that we do as a firm is that we need to stay on the pulse of our clients and what's, what's really impacting our clients out in the market. So much like Zykus does, we issue our own annual procurement survey. And as we go through these surveys, we think about, you know, what is topics, you know, what is top of mind topics that we want to discuss. And so this past year, we, you know, having been in the trenches, you know, Aged by both finance procurement, you know, groups that are saying, "Hey, I know the savings materializing," and also being aged by procurement functions who are saying, "Hey, we're trying to develop source plans to derive benefits and savings, and we're trying to come up with a measurement, you know, methodology and a performance tracking capability, et cetera." We get to see both sides of the fence, and so as part of our our 2017 survey. We really wanted to reach out and query as many finance professionals as well as procurement professionals as possible to really kind of get their perspective on what's going on. And so our search here, which, which we're going to go through just a couple slides, I'd encourage everybody to get a chance to read the full survey because a lot of interesting information in there. But we had 440.
property, finance and procurement executives across a bunch of different industries participating. So I think we got a really good kind of, you know, risk rate, and I think that really helps solidify the findings. And, and what we're going to talk, talk about is, is you know, why is there that gap? Why is there that brick wall between the two of them? One of the first things and one of the biggest eye-popping things we found when we um, first saw the survey results was the fact that there is a big discrepancy between the way finance views procurement and the way procurement views themselves. And so basically one of the big takeaways, is, and I'm sure a lot of these procurement professionals you know, seen this or understand this or, or is not new to you, but over almost 50% of finance leaders really have a different opinion on, on the value and and the benefit that pyramid is bringing to an organization. 40% of finance leaders didn't believe that even 20% of the savings procurement is negotiating is dropping to the bottom line. That's that's pretty significant. I mean, 20% or less. If you go in to read the actual survey, you can see, you know, as you get up to 40% or less, 60% or less, 80% or less, Right, it's it's big number, and then it's concerning that finance doesn't believe that that you know the work that procurement is doing is delivering the savings. I'd also kind of comment that even there is a big disparity, and even the fact that 30% of procurement leaders don't believe that all the value that they're driving is flowing to the bottom line. The other issue, and I think that's probably a topic that's worthy of discussion. But as we move on. We're we'll into kind of what are the key reasons and, and driving the difference of opinions. And like the number one you know, response that we saw from the survey was that, you know, bits are not enforced and they are spent on other areas. The classic example is, you know, you come to the end of the year, you have used up your budget. If you use your budget, you're going to lose it. So everyone wants to go and spend, right? The situations where, you know, if I save in one area, one category, I'm like, that frees me up to go, you know, do another pet project or go out and buy some other stuff that, that we had budgeted for, and so I'm going to use the budget there. The reason was around realized versus negotiated savings, effectively tracked, right? A lot of times, it just it's difficult to actually track savings because, you, you know, are we going to go and look at every PO and every invoice that we see to validate that, you know, we got the right savings? That's a lot of effort, and so a lot of times what you'll see is that you negotiate a contract and, and they say, I saved, you know, $100,000, I saved a million dollars, whatever it may be, and nobody ever goes back to validate whether or not they've actually realized it or not. Due to a myriad of reasons, you know, at the end of the year, finance will look at and say, hey, realize the savings. We spent as much this year as last year, and they don't really know why. They're just making that statement. The big reason was calculated savings were not realistic or accurate. That's that's a classic case. I'm going to talk a little bit more that, about this on the next slide. But again, it's it's I think, and this is you know part of their issue too is that they have you know they demonstrate value, and so they're looking at every every, every possibly beneficial factor they can, and you know, inflate savings. And there's ways that they can do that. And so you know that kind of leaves a distrust and a distaste when your finance is looking at what savings achieve. You know, the other types of things that happen are changes in needs or specifications. So the beer, I think I'm going to use a certain part or a certain service. You know, computers are a classic example, right? You know, I, I scout a particular laptop model that I want, and within the first two months of the year, you realize that they've discontinued that model and they've issued the next model, and it's, it's more expensive. So, you know, you don't realize the full benefit of the thing that you wanted. And I continue to go through these, but, but I think you all get the idea of what's going on. Because as I mentioned, right, one of the big issues is, is how you measure, how do you define savings? Now, this, this, when you first look at it, it could be a little bit confusing, but this is derived out of an actual case that I had where I worked with a very large university system and actually committed to try and save the system $250 million over five years. And came to us and they said, we want to have this initiative, but we have a big problem. No one believes any of the savings that we deliver. 
so what was interesting about this university is they have multiple campuses with buyers on every campus. I was able to go out and talk to a bunch of the buyers, and I was able to talk, and they have they have the same buyers for the same categories at different different places. So I was able to talk to the buyer for say lab equipment at multiple campuses, and I was asking them, and they negotiated with the same suppliers for the same item, and so I was able to ask them a lot about their contracts, how much they saved. And what was surprising was, is I heard very, very different responses for the exact same items from the exact same suppliers. And I, you know, I started to dig it in. I realized, you know, what we're doing was, if person would be saying, well, you know, a $100,000 in one, one. And so would come and say, well, it was a three-year contract. Over the three years, I was able to reduce it by $500,000. And then the person was saying, well, it's a three-year contract, and if I, if I look at all the savings I get, at, you know, edited across those three years, I get you know, $1,000 the first year, I get, you know, $200,000 the second year, that's $300,000. Then I get another $200,000, that's $1,000. And it starts to count, and so that's where you get get this counted benefit. So that's really confusing to finance because they don't have a schematic and singular way of looking at it. It's all problematic for finances because they're done on an annual basis. So if I'm if I'm saying I did a three year contract and I say five hundred thousand dollars over three years, it's time to say, well how does that how does that apply to the budget? We really work with our to kind of help them think about how do we align our savings calculations so they can tie neatly to the budget. So we usually talk about savings on an annualized basis, which is the source of truth, and then we talk about we actually measure and calculate those. So is, is we look at the life cycle of the sourcing arrangement or negotiation with our suppliers, and we realize there's events that trigger savings. First event is how you identified. So you identified, I haven't done any sourcing yet, but I've looked at all my spend, I understand my categories, and I, hey, we, we spent X amount of dollars on, on, on a lab equipment exam, right? And we're using a lot of suppliers. I think if, if, I, if I concentrate my volume and pick a primary supplier, maybe a secondary supplier, just using my volume and my negotiation ability, I can save 5% in that category, right? I've identified it, but I haven't really done anything. I've just set my strategy, right? As I move phase, the value captured phase is I've gone through a sourcing event or a negotiation event, and I've actually negotiated with my suppliers, and I probably even signed a contract. So I know where the things is coming from. I haven't bought off the contract yet, so actually I haven't realized it, but I captured that value, right? And so very, very critical because if it's, uh, say 2017, and I'm reporting 2017 savings, and I'm saying I save $100,000 annually, right? I can't have finance go whack $100,000 out of the budget for 20 because there's not enough run rate in 2017. So that's where we get into kind of value realized is, is real tracking down to each PO, each invoice, how much we save, and looking at, you know, any kind of rent rate to kind of get up to speed on a contract, um, any type of work with a, a supplier to kind of get those savings in, you know, understanding any kind of switching costs that are involved if I'm if I'm moving from an incumbent to another supplier, retooling costs if I'm changing from one part to another. So there's a number of things that you really have to factor in there, and those have to go in to our savings numbers and and financing understand that. In the old days. You know, CFOs would push, hey, the government says I, you're going to save a million dollars. We're going to take a million dollars out of the budget. And it led to a lot of acrimony, not just finance, but with business stakeholders because they're like, oh, my God, I don't want to work with procurement because all that happens is the budget gets whacked way more than we ever um, did. And it just results in a whole bunch of problems for us because we can never buy what we can um, one of the big observations we had within our procurement survey, um, an opening large percentage of, of companies, and this is this is across the board, view uh, view procurement as more tactical than strategic. Right? Cool. I mean, 
ask people in an organization, what is it that procurement does? What value do they bring to the table? They're going to tell you, well, you know, they're really good at helping us cut purchase orders. They're really good at helping us onboard and set up a supplier. And they're really good at going out and helping us negotiate a contract. And even in those areas, they'll probably say, well, you know, I ordered something, you know, three months ago and I still haven't got it. Or it's taking them, you know, over a month to negotiate, you know, the new contract. So there isn't some frustrating on that. But, I mean, I think what, what things aren't looking at is is that that real procurement departments are very kind of strategic. I'll get into that next slide. But, but the things that we see in here every day working with clients, and that kind of contribute to the perception of procurement being more tactical. And again, we see a lot of you know, large, complex organizations, with a lot of you know business units and departments, and we see you know a decentralized and uncoordinating sourcing practices leading to multiple contracts with the same suppliers for the same parts, as I mentioned, with the university system, right? So that leads to continuous leads to multiple contracts without the right without having similar conditions which is other problems, um, and is obviously fragmented, not well understood. Um, you know, people take a look at something and they won't even know the full volume that we're buying. They don't know the exact specifications and requirements. So they do their best to try and kind of go ahead and, and negotiate a good value or go out and do a good sourcing event because they don't have a complete picture, you know, it kind of falls short on them. Another is strategic sourcing is organized around kind of trunk contracts as opposed to categories. And I'll put this in context. Going to that university example, when I talk about lab equipment, that, that category was a $100 million category on an annual basis. You talk to the buyers and they say, hey, what are you doing today? And they'll say, well, I negotiate a $5,000 contract, and I'll be a $5,000 contract on a $100 million category, and that's where you're spending your time. Is that really strategic? Is that generating the most savings you're going to get? And like, yeah, but I need to do this because that's what the stakeholder is asking me to do. So, you know, work with them to get them to realize that, you know, you're not just renegotiating a contract. You are representing a hundred dollars of annual spend. So you are kind of like an investment manager and your job is to really figure out how to best spend that money. And if you can if you get that $100 million to $90 million, that you drive huge benefits. That's where you should focus your time. We'll rethink how to, how to manage and, and, and the needs of the business owners that have these smaller contracts. But we have to put those in context. We have to prioritize those. A lot of emphasis is always placed on driving the lowest price, which is relationships with suppliers, right? So this is a classic, right? You, know, you get the classic, the classic statement is you get what you pay for. Right? So companies realize that you know you can always beat down suppliers, you can always get a really, really low price, but you're going to sacrifice quality. Right? And so we need to we need to be able to work with you know our units and our suppliers to make sure that we're getting prices without sacrificing quality, you know, any other TCO elements to it. Um, really, really critical. And so I'm not going to go through the last bullet point, but I think you get you get the idea. And again, driving home the point of why procurement is really a strategic, you know, you know, driver to the organization as opposed to the tactical driver. The fact that, and you take this example on the left, it's rel relatively simplified. But if you take a company that's got, you know, $1 million in revenue on an annual basis, and you compare what it would do to the bottom line if you were to cut 5% out of spend versus an increased revenues by 5%, is that by reducing your expense by 5%, you're actually generating a $28 uplift to the bottom line. If you increase your, your revenues by 5%, you're only going to contribute $3 million to the bottom line. And if you most organizations out there, it's surprising to hear this and look at this and realize that you'll invest all kinds of money into sales and revenue and top-line growth. They don't like to invest a lot of money in, in and procurement systems and anything else that can help, you know, improve the performance of, of procurement. And rising because you know, it does it does a huge impact and a big business benefit driver. Any other observations we had and look 
looking at, at this that we did is that if you looked at the respondents, and one in five respondents described their assessment process is very effective. So if you looked at what what was being, what makes them effective and what was the commonality across them, if you looked at the responses, you'd see a couple things. One is that they've adopted spend analysis in their day-to-day -day processes. So they're they're using spend analytical tools, third-party spend analytical tools. You know, they're they're tying spend analytics to budget. You know. A very micro basis. Uh, second thing that they're doing is they're actually going out there and in a capability around measuring savings and tracking savings, which is really, really critical. A lot of companies don't do that. They kind of stop it. Hey, we've gone through the sourcing process. We've documented the savings. We've given it out to the business people. I'm going to the next sourcing basis. And that's the last time anybody thinks of savings, right? So, so what leading respondents are saying, they don't do that. They actually they are, are tracking and measuring benefits. The last thing that they're doing is, is they're, is they're running their organization around people to enable to do both spend analysis and track savings, right? And they're working closely with, and this is critical, is they're working closely with finance around a methodology, an approach, a process to track benefits. So one, it's saving believable, Two, savings can be documented. Three, savings can be tracked. And that's really, really critical. And so I think I can pass it on back to Kanishka to go into the QA and introduce Bob, who can talk a little about Qualcomm. Thanks, Kate. Um, so, what we want to do is kind of engage Rob in a conversation and try to find out you know, the journey that he had at Qualcomm implementing the savings and solution. Uh, so, Rob, you know, just before we start, uh, you know, if you can just kind of tell us about a successful implementation that you had uh, of the solution uh, at Qualcomm, if you can share some kind of metrics so that, you know, folks have an idea of, you know, what was the scale of uh, operations and what kind of, you know, numbers you're looking at and so on, maybe, you know, the number of projects, number of users, and so on. Sure, absolutely. Thank you for, uh, for that. Uh, can you hear me okay? First of all, I want to make sure. Uh, we good. Perfect. Thank you. So, uh, hello everyone. The, uh, the Qualcomm team, many of them are on the on the conference with us today. Uh, worked really hard with uh, Azekis implementation of many different modules, I, and I think it ends up very well with what Kyle was mentioning. So, the first thing that we did it was it, whenever you think about a procurement organization, you always need to know uh, where your spends are, uh, and not only where they are, but what types of spend are they. Uh, and, and that's where the, the spends analysis really came into play. And we spent a lot of time not just generating reports with, with a number, but actually using the spend analysis tool to add value to the numbers by pulling data in from multiple sources. So you could really understand the, the spend patterns. And, and, and that was really helpful because that gave us a foundation for our sourcing teams to go out and negotiate with suppliers. So historically, we were always going to suppliers and getting our spend reports and or, or looking at our PO commitments. And for the first time, it was like, tools, uh, we were able to actually go to suppliers with very detailed reports uh, that showed our, our spend habits. And so we were able to control our fate there uh, with, with spend analysis. And then when we moved into savings, it was an interesting implementation. So we were implementing the, the savings tool at the same time as the spend analysis tool, and it, it took us um, right around a year, I think, if, if you think of the adoption uh, time, the need, and, and whatnot. Uh, and, and we rolled out the uh, the savings tool globally to all of our options. Uh, and uh, all our sourcing teams. So we have a primary sourcing team in, in the U.S. Uh, as well as uh, APAC, EMEA. So it, it's a global tool. Not only have we rolled it out with procurement, uh, but we've rolled it out globally with our finance partners as well. So it's not just a procurement tool at Qualcomm. It is a savings tracking tool at Qualcomm, which 
I think is a big difference uh, because now you're bringing two groups together uh, using this tool. And, and as Kyle very uh, nicely uh, pointed out, there's the finance group and, and the procurement group, and normally those two are very divided. Uh, it, in our lot, we've actually really partnered together very well to obtain a lot of benefits that I'm sure we can speak about today. I think some of the metrics that we want to talk about, though, would be so the number of projects. So currently, we have almost 600 projects uh, in the tool for, for FY17. Uh, if you look at projects for the upcoming years, uh, we're, we're on track for uh, almost 800 projects. Uh, the way we define projects are anything with savings. Um, cost reduction mostly is our, is our primary savings target. So uh, in terms of savings, uh, you know, I, I can't give you the exact number. Corporate communications made me promise to uh, not give any actual numbers, uh, but it, but it's between the 40 and 50 million dollar annual mark. Um, so, uh, can you, what else would you like to cover? Is there anything that you'd like me to dive into some detail on, or how would you like to proceed? Just uh, you know, before we get into that, um, probably you know, what we would like to understand is what were the key drivers. That was there for you when you kind of started the project. I mean, what was that was a compelling need for you to start this project? Uh, what were the objectives that kind of you set for yourself and the team that you wanted to reach? Uh, kind of give a very good context to kind of what you guys uh, started and are driving towards. Uh, fantastic. So, so first the pay organization that we're all part of, uh, we were poured up into finance. Uh, it was a major shift for us. Uh, historically, uh, procurement didn't always report into a, a finance role. And so uh, we were very similar to the case Kyle pointed out, where uh, we would report savings numbers, uh, but finance would say, well, I, I, I don't see that impact to my P&L. Uh, so is it really a savings? Uh, with multiple things that really drove us to need to standardize. Uh, we also, when you think of a global organization, we needed to uh, standardize a way of reporting consistency. Uh, when you think of how savings is calculated, all of those issues of what is your baseline, uh, how do you identify a baseline, uh, how do you calculate savings, uh, when we look at a report, is this cost reduction? Is it cost avoidance? Uh, what was the conversion rate? Uh, did finance sign off? Uh, these are the types of things that we would uh, always face where we would go to finance and report our savings. And it really got to a point where uh, uh, with the customer saying, we think we can save you money, and, and, and there was no perceived value because uh, we say, okay, we'll save you X percent, but it, the group would go back to that functional stakeholder, that, that project leader, and say, well, we don't see those savings, so you really didn't save anything. Uh, as well as there was always the fear that if we have money, it's going to be taken out of the budget, and people wanted to use that budget money for other things, more value-added uh, items uh, that they couldn't afford before, uh, which from a finance perspective may have been okay. However, from a procurement perspective, we would never really be able to demonstrate that we saved anything to a finance person because the, the money that we saved on project A was allocated towards project B. So at the end of the day, the baseline never really changed for us. It was always a moving target. Uh, uh, and so really trying to set ourselves up for success to prove the procurement value, it, it took a lot of work. Now, luckily we had the Zykus tool, the iSave tool, to add some credibility 
Excel and SharePoint based systems uh, before that. And now with the Zyke tool, it just added a layer of credibility to now we have an official savings tracking tool. It's not an Excel sheet. Uh, we have a tool that can route for approvals and track history and document uh, quotes and things like that. So from an auditing perspective, it really uh, streamlined that process. So now we could audit projects very, very quickly, whereas before we may have to go out to different email messages or different SharePoint sites or, or what have you. So we're able to centralize that information. Uh, and, and we really with finance. At the end of the day, I think any savings program, you really need to have an alignment with finance uh, because really, if you can work with you as a partner, it, it really aligns a lot of the conversations that you have. So what we were doing before we really implemented any tool was having conversations with finance to say, what's your pain point? Can we build on what we have in common and build a common foundation, says a base definition, what types of savings that we capture, uh, and and how should we calculate that savings? So both groups will mind, and then we'll be able to leverage the tool to enforce if we had common ground with finance and we were able to leverage a tool to enforce that on a global perspective. And, and Rob, there are a couple of questions coming in from the audience here. So I think one of the key themes that we notice here is, you know, how did you get all the stakeholders to kind of buy in? And uh, I think the key stakeholders here were, uh, you know, finance as well as the senior leadership team. Uh, how did you kind of get to a common ground? What were the kind of uh, things that you agreed upon? Uh, you know, what were the items that each team kind of signed up for and you, know, you kind of shook hands on that? So you want to understand how kind of got that whole system to kind of work together, right? There are a lot of people who are kind of asking this question. Yeah, absolutely. That was actually, believe it or not, that was very uh, straightforward for, for us. One of the benefits of a source to pay organization and reporting into finance, you both uh, in finance have the same boss. So we, we actually, uh, our senior leadership um, sat down with the FO and said, uh, you've given me targets to hit. We need to achieve savings to prove our worth. We feel that procurement is generating a lot of value that is uh, articulately displayed in some of these reporting. So we would like to set up a cross-functional team with procurement and finance to drive ownership throughout the organizations. So procurement our 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 hat in our hand in finance. We partner with you to come up with a best-in-class process where you able to report save guys want to make sure savings is the same number we actually already identified the why something might be different Up, down And uh, uh, Rob, the other question is user adoption, right? I mean, how did you get the entire organization to kind of uh, buy into that? Uh, you have, you know, folks spread geographically. How did you get them to kind of uh, start using this? And how big a transition was this from the, you know, the manual process of using Excel, emails, and so on uh, to use an automated tool? Uh, that was interesting when you have a global team. So I would say, what we did is we had to drive it from the top down again so that we very clearly told all of the procurement organization team members that there's one consistent system for savings tracking and reporting and that is, in this case, the, the Zykus iSave tool. 
So if you're working on projects that aren't listed in the tool, uh, either you need to move them into the tool, or if they don't meet the, the, the cut in terms of potential benefit, then stop working on those. And all of those projects are viewed on a weekly basis uh, for status updates and whatnot. Folks would go into the tool and provide their updates. So that became a dashboard. Uh, so from a procurement standpoint, it was very uh, easy to mandate the use of the tool. From a finance standpoint, what really helped us was a directive from the top down. But we don't bring finance into the process at the end, after all the negotiations have been done. We usually bring finance in to the beginning, and we ask them for the baseline. So our procurement groups, spends reports, build their sourcing strategies, work with finance to say, what is my starting point? What is the baseline? And in our case, the baseline is always what is budget, or the budget outlook. And finance is aware of that in the beginning. Our debt of savings is the difference between the final contract price and the baseline or outlook. And so our savings calculation is very straightforward. If, uh, if it's capital, uh, we apply accounting treatment. We, have, uh, we take the standard 12 months for OPEX savings. Uh, and so that is extremely simple. And once we get to the end of the project where we've applied that calculation, we then route that project to the same finance analyst who gave us the baseline information to sign off. And so when they're signing off, they're not necessarily approving the savings amount. What they're approving is, is what Correct? Yes, yeah, they provided it. Calculation correct? Yes, yeah, it's very straightforward. And, and, and three, did, did acknowledge that um, that is real. And so when we provide reporting involved in the beginning, uh, both sourced and finance, they're involved at the end of the negotiation, and, and they're aligned. So nothing gets reported without both groups being aligned. Now, there's some interesting things when we talk about is the budget reduced or is the money reinvested into another initiative, but, but that's how we're able to uh, bring grants along uh, is because we include them throughout the entire pro process. Perfect. Uh, the other thing, uh, Rob, is uh, did you, uh, you know, can we help from probably you know third party consultants or external consultants or analyst firms to kind of uh, help you decide how best to go ahead with this kind of a process change? Again, it could be simply in terms of how to set those controls in terms of having the common ground with the finance team, how to set those accounting standards and so on. So was something completely uh, done in house or you had reached out to any kind of external organizations for any kind of assistance? So one of the benefits we have at Qualcomm is is uh, we're part of uh, personally I'm part of the Center of Excellence at Qualcomm, women people uh, who we come from cross functional backgrounds uh, within Qualcomm and outside of Qualcomm. So we didn't hire any third party um, group to help us. We actually use the Center of Excellence to roll out the program. So at Qualcomm, the Center of Excellence group actually owns the suite of Zykus tools. We're responsible for those tools. So there's a, a point person for savings, there's a point person for sourcing, point person for spend analysis. Uh, and we work with all of the internal groups in Qualcomm. And our goals and objectives are set aside from sourcing and finance and, and what have you. So we control um, how things are implemented. And likewise, we actually own the uh, things reporting and auditing from a procurement perspective. Our group is sort of the impartial third party. And so uh, we, a lot of the 
the the rules and 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 policies that come from senior management, CFO and and whatnot. So it's from a top down approach. We receive directions from the executives and we implement it and coordinate with each of the teams for training. Uh, what we think that works best is first of all you've got people that that is their job implement best practice policies and procedures do uh, uh, but also tied very tightly to finance and to the source to pay organization so we we understand from a finance perspective one of my team members has an extremely detailed finance background so we understand the finance point of view. Uh, we understand the sourcing point of view, uh, the, the, the accounts payable point of view. Uh, so it's because we set apart from those groups, but we come from those groups that we're able to implement programs like this. Great. And, and uh, Kyle, uh, from your experience, uh, would you want to share some thoughts on, you know, for the best way for companies to, uh, you know, go up when they're going to be implementing such a uh, new solution or a new approach to the way the procurement and financing works. Uh, is there anything you want to share? Well, Kanishka, I want to go back to a couple of the questions that you and Rob were talking about. So um, there's a question I think in the um, in the chat group where somebody asked specifically about how do, you, how do we demonstrate that procurement savings impact EBITDA? So that's a really great question. So uh, we were with clients on that one. And so when I went back and I, and I talked about the different stages of savings, I mentioned that there's value identified, value captured, and value realized. So at the value identified stage, we actually work with clients to develop what we call a sourcing charter. And that's just a fancy way of saying that we, we document our sourcing strategy and we sit down with, with the bid stakeholders, the finance stakeholders, and procurement. And we all sit there and talk about, you know, are we doing what we do? Do we all have the same expectations? And is this OPEX or CAPEX? And we, we go down to the GL code if you want, department, the supplier, and we can talk about what we're buying. And so we, at that point, we're identifying whether or not it's, it's going to hit EBA or if it's going to be some capital savings or some other types of savings. Um, also to identify whether or not it's cost reduction, it's cost avoidance, it's, um, you know, some other types of savings benefit, you know, et cetera. And we'll document that in the charter. And then when we go out and actually do the sourcing event or the negotiation with the suppliers, we can sit down with them, um, you know, after the fact and say, hey, we went down with you before, we said we were going to save this much in OPEX. We negotiated with the supplier, and this is how much we actually captured, right? So at that point, we can identify, did we do better or do 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 worse than we projected? And then we can they lay out the framework for how are we going to track it. So what are we going to look at so that we can go back and see how this how this hits the budget. So that's really critical. Um, the other, I think the other question was how do you get people to adopt this type of methodology, and which is an interesting question to me because the reason why I really like street sourcing is that at the end of the day, I know how much value I've driven it. I've driven I've told my the organizations I'm working with, right? I can go back and say, I, I saved a hundred million dollars this year to that organization, or you know what have you. So I think that type of environment I see our, our clients kind of pick up and it's like when they start thinking of themselves as saying, hey, this is how much value I'm driving to the bottom line, and it's being recognized across the organization, not just within procurement, and everybody's seeing the value they deliver. They definitely get excited about it, and they definitely, you know, start thinking more and more about how they can do more creative ways to to save save dollars in the organization. So, um, we and we do, a, you know, one of the other things that we do is we look at kind of how the departments are organized, you know, how incentives are and performance, you know, annual percent of goal, performance goals are kind of developed. And so we'll work across an organization. So we don't just look at processes; we look at Policies, policies, procedures, systems, you know, organization design, et cetera. And so we'll look across all of those spectrums and we'll talk about how do we transform, transform organizations. And, you know, I see the clients today, people are busy, they don't have a lot of available time, they don't have a lot of available resources, 
and you know they they welcome all the extra help that we can bring and you know there's a goal ROI for them and so they they see that you know working with with consulting firms is a great way to kind of uh, accelerate the adoption of these tools to put in the methodologies to see how things have you know been tried other types of clients and can be implemented faster and more accurately so so welcome that and they and as i said there's there's you know we have very, very good ROI on these types of on these type of engagements Okay, yeah, that was that was most helpful. Uh, so, Rob, probably you know the last couple of questions for you. Uh, in terms of you know you know uh, people looking at implementing a uh, you know savings management solution in their uh, companies, uh, what would uh, be your kind of tips for them or kind of learning from uh, your uh, experience or the best practices, things that you can suggest, or you know these are the potential pitfalls that you need to look out for. So, what are your you know suggestions for you know these customers? I would say, and, and this may sound funny, and I, I can explain, is is uh, don't waste a good hardship. And by that is uh, don't expect this process to be easy. One of the things that I learned was uh, savings is a very personal topic. Fine has their view, procurement has a different view, at, or, or could be disconnected on that. And getting alignment it is not going to be easy at first. Uh, I think the approach that we took that being the most successful was being on simple wins. So even starting off with the idea of what is your plan started multiple conversations of, well, in the case, Baseline A. If if we haven't purchased it before, uh, then it, we need to use baseline B. Um, there were there were a lot of rabbit trails that we taken down. So I think when approaching this project, really take time to think about not just how do you create a report. Right. The, this project is more than the result. It's actually building that common foundation of where do you start uh, with defining simple things that, that took for granted. We thought a baseline was a very simple thing. We thought cost reduction was very easily defined. Uh, we thought cost avoidance was very easily defined. What we found is in terms of the source to pay group, there are different definitions of what cost reduction was versus cost avoidance. So the first thing I would say when you start this project is to really define that common ground. The common ground will then be used to determine how you use a tool to build upon that. Uh, if you implement a tool without that foundation, you're really setting yourselves up for, for I would say, to be quite honest, because you're just auditing connect that already exists. Um, uh, so definitely get that common ground beforehand. Uh, secondly, I would say don't underestimate the, the pushback that you may receive within your own group, whether you're part of finance or whether you're part of procurement. From a finance perspective, uh, you want to control the budget. And if procurement comes in and starts saying, well, we can reduce or affect your P&L, uh, what's going to happen with that budget money? Is it going to be reassigned or can we use it for something else? Likewise, within procurement, if you very, very uh, nearly define your definition of savings, don't that that's very personal to people as well because they're given targets to hit. And it can be seen as you're making it difficult for those sourcing professionals to hit their tar target. Um, what I would say is, being a year and a half down the road, with that, I would say the amount of opportunities that have opened up to procurement have phenomenal because of the, those definitions, because of the tool. Because now, with every savings project, we're clearly able to articulate 
procurement had a positive impact to the P&L. Now, you may not see this half a million dollars in savings in your P&L because finance reallocated it to a different project. But instead of losing that savings completely, finance and procurement have come together to say there was an impact really moved that money for another uh, another uh, investment vehicle, whatever uh, that vehicle may be for you. The key, though, is now you have visibility into that. Uh, and and now is actually reaching out to procurement to say, how else can we leverage this process? Because now that we've done that, we have a platform. We have this iSAVE tool. Finance is used to it. Procure is used to it. We've rolled it out globally. So for all of these other savings initiatives that may have, have been involved, uh, and many of them, mergers and acquisitions is one that just comes to mind, is can we use that same process? Can we use that same foundation? Yes. Okay, another another point is, you know, often at Qualcomm, I, I always use the phrase, do anything well if you can't take the punishment. Now that we've moved beyond cost avoidance, PL, now finance is coming to us and saying, well, hey, we realize now that you have all of this information in the tool, let's start monitoring cash flow. Can we reporting cash flow on a quarterly basis? So now is actually getting involved in other finance areas uh, because we have a tool, we have a common understanding. Uh, so we just think we've reached to a point where we've we've succeeded. Now more things are coming for us to support. Uh, I think as well uh, when we think of in the future, um, I think the wall between finance and procurement is really going to dissolve, and I think we're going to see that as budgets are affected, as annual budgets are are reduced, just as the normal course of business, because we have this relationship now with finance and this commonality, now they're actually calling us to help us support their budgets. Where before, we were always having to go to them and earn their trust or go to them with ideas. And I would say in the last six months, the business has come to us now because finance is advocating or advocating that the bid reach out to procurement because of that common ground again, right? So finance has really become a cheerleader for procurement in many cases. Um, and, and how do you manage those projects? Because now your project pipeline has grown, and you need to be more strategic on what projects you handle because your sourcing staff may grow, or maybe you need it to grow to support those projects. So it, it's just one step. All of those are, or all of those issues are very good to have, but it's something that I would have forecasted a year ago because we were struggling so much to understand even the basic definition. Did Kanishka? Yeah. I, uh, I think, uh, you know, we kind of uh, uh, turn out of time. So we probably will take questions today. I know there are a lot of questions that we asked. So if you can just send us a note uh, with all your questions at webcast at zykos.com. Uh, we will, you know, get the answers. Uh, I'll reach out to Rob and Kyle to get their perspectives, and we'll ensure that we answer back all those questions. Uh, we were uh, unfortunately we're not able to take the questions today because of uh, time constraints, but we'll ensure that we get all the answers back if you can send us those questions by mail. Uh, thank you, Rob. Thank you, Kyle. It was a fantastic session. Uh, I hope uh, you know everybody found it very interesting and uh, informative. Talk to everybody soon. Thank, thank you. you.